Hello, in this video, we're going to provide a brief review of how to compute the cost of the different components of a company's capital. So the three main components are equity, uh, preferred stock, and bonds. Equity, we, we mean the common stock of a firm. So the cost of equity is the required return by common stockholders. And this is based on the risk of the cash flow from the firm to common stockholders. There are two major methods for computing the cost of equity, and we have seen both, so we're going to review them uh, here. The first is based on the dividend growth model. This is the model where we assume that a stock um, pays a, a dividend that grow at a constant rate. And the second method is the security market line or capital asset pricing model approach. So first, let's take a look at the div dividend growth model. Uh, remember that the required return according to the dividend growth model has two components. The first is the dividend yield component, and then the second is the capital gains yield component. And in the constant growth model, the capital gains yield is the same as the constant growth rate. Because the, because the only source of growth for in the dividend growth model is by dividend growth. Um, and the uh, subscript E here is a notation for equity. So since we will be dealing with many different types of returns, we want to label them appropriately. So to write them in the equation form, dividend yield, dividend yield is defined as the dividend yield one divided by the price in year zero. So this is D1 is dividend in year one, P0 is the price of the stock in year zero. And G here, G is the constant growth rate for the stock. Let's go over a quick example. So we have in, in this case, we have a company who is expected to pay a dividend. So remember when we see the term expected, that means we are referring to dividend in year one. So dividend year one in this example is $1.50. And we saw that dividend has been growing at a constant rate of 5.1%. So that is our growth rate. And the market is expected that to continue. The price of the stock, the current price, so current price means this is the price in year zero, is $25. What is the cost of equity? So since we are given dividend and dividend growth rate, we can apply the dividend growth model to find the required return. And it turns out to be 11%. Since in this module we are focused on, on applying the method that we have learned before, uh, it's important to be aware which method is the most appropriate in a particular situation. So let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of using the dividend growth model. The advantage of the dividend growth model is relatively simple and it's easy to understand. The disadvantages mostly is that it only applies to companies that currently pay dividend and also that we assume the dividend grow at a constant rate. So if the growth rate for dividend is not constant um, or even reasonably constant, then this model doesn't apply. So again, there is a distinction between theory and practice. So in theory, the dividend should be absolute, growth rate should be absolutely constant. But if we find that a company has average dividend growth rate around, for example, 3%, and some year maybe 2.8, another year maybe 3.1%, but it's right around 3% on average. We'll probably be okay with that, that uh, applying this model. However, if we find that a company's dividend is growing at 10% one year and 0% the next year, it may average to 5%, but it's definitely not constant. Another caveat and important part about this company, uh, this particular model, is that it is extremely sensitive to the growth rate that you assume. Because every 1% changes in the growth rate will increase or decrease your um, estimate on the cost of equity by 1%. The last disadvantage of this particular model is that the model does not explicitly take into account risk. And we'll talk about that, um, uh, why that is important. Because it, it, in the, if the assumption is that the current risk of the cash flow or the risk profile of the cash flow is going to continue, then this is not a major concern. However, if we have to do any risk adjustment, then the dividend growth model becomes uh, impossible to use because it does not allow us to take that into account. 
Fortunately, we have a second approach, and the second approach is called the capital asset pricing model or the security market line. So SML stands for security market line, and CAPM stands for capital asset pricing model. Uh, this is the approach that we have seen before. So in order to estimate the cost of equity, we'll need the basic factors that go into the capital asset pricing model, which are one, the risk free rate, second, the market risk premium. So remember that the market risk premium is defined as the difference between the expected market return and the risk free rate. Now the last component is the systematic risk of the asset. So in this case, since we are computing equity, then you'll be the systematic risk of the common stock. And the required return on the cost of equity, so again, we use E to stand for equity, is equal to the risk free rate plus D beta of equity so again here here stands for equity or common stock of the firm times the market risk premium let's take a take a look at an example to review how we will compute this uh, so again we need to get a different types of data to apply the capital surprising model so here we know that the beta of the stock is 5.8 so this is the beta of equity and the risk free rate is 6.1% in here, we are given the market risk premium. So in other words, we don't have to subtract the two. So using the capital asset pricing model, we can estimate the cost of equity to be the risk-free rate, which is 6.1%, plus the systematic risk of the stock, which in this case is 0.58, times the market risk premium. So in here is 8.6%. So if you are given the market return, then you need to subtract the risk-free rate from the market return to get the market risk premium. In this particular problem, we are given the market risk premium, so we can use it directly. Now, uh, in this particular case, by design, it turns out that the required return is also 11%. Now what happens if we use two approaches and we come up with different estimates? So let's first take, a, take, take one step back. Uh, in a lot of situations, you may be reduced to using one of two approaches because um, we'll talk about the advantages of this, the disadvantages of the two approach in a minute. Um, however, if, you, if your company has sufficient information to, for you to use both approach, then you're lucky because in that case, then you can check the estimate from one approach versus the other. Um, and then you can decide which one is more appropriate in a given situation. If both approach are equally appropriate and equally reliable, then you can take an average between the two. So again, we are doing forecasts here. There's no, um, there are no solid theory uh, in terms of um, if you both, if both approaches are equally viable, then you may want to take an average. But how do we know which approach is more appropriate? Well, we want we can take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of the second method, the capital uh, capital asset pricing model method. So. The main, main advantage of the capital asset pricing model is that it allows you to explicitly adjust for systematic risk. So if there is different differences in risk, we could um, make modification. So it works, it applies to all company as long as we can compute beta. And we're going to take a take an extension in uh, next to see what happens if we don't. Um, we recall that in order to compute beta, we need to have the price of the stock, and the price of the stock uh, and, and the price of the stock need to be publicly traded so that we have a return history. So not just one price, but the historic price of the of the company. Uh, so it gives that list to some of the disadvantages because one of the main disadvantage of using the capital asset pricing model is that we have to come up with estimates about future market condition. We have to estimate what the expected market risk premium is, which changes over time. And then the other is we also have to compute and adjust and estimate beta, which also change over time. So the biggest disadvantage of the capital pricing model is that we are using past data to predict future. If the future is not, uh, it's going to be very different from the past. So for example, if you know that the company is going through a merger and acquisition, or if you think that the, uh, the market environment for the company is going to be significantly different, then assuming that the past will be the same as in the future is not reliable.
So when you're weighing which method is more appropriate, that really is depends on the situation. You have to look at the company you are, you are, or the project that you're evaluating and ask critical questions on, do I, do I have um, reliable information to allow me to use one model over another? And sometimes you may not. In that case, you may want to use both models. And that, again, will give you a range to check your hypothesis. Okay. Um, We'll end this lecture here, and then in the next um, in the next video, we're gonna take a little bit more, uh, take a, a deeper dive into looking at um, systematic risk because adjusting for systematic risk in project um, valuation is a very important um, component.